Anna Sorokin is not a character out of a movie. She is not a figment of anyone's imagination or a fairy tale princess written about in children's books. And I won't be able to cover every salacious or interesting detail about Anna Sorokin in this two part series. But what I do know is Anna Sorokin is a real woman. However, the real question is who is Anna Delvey? Let's start Anna Sorokin's story at the end. The headline of The Guardian on October 8, 2022 reads, Convicted con artist Anna Sorokin released from jail, attorney says. Yes, con artist is in the title of that article. The self-professed 31-year-old filthy rich trust fund baby from Germany was released from jail and held by Immigration and Customs Enforcement since March of 2021. Now Judge Charles Conroy has approved her transfer from detention to home confinement while she fights deportation back to Germany. What if I told you the only true statement about Anna Sorokin before she went to jail was her first name, Anna, and maybe her age? Anna Sorokin recreated herself as Anna Delvey, who was a rich German heiress with a $67 million trust and the daughter of a diplomat or a solar panel business or a heating and cooling business and at other times the daughter of an oil baron who came to America to bedazzle the art world all in her mind. Now before I get knee deep into the con and Anna's arrest, so far we know Anna Delvey is really Anna Sorokin. But where does the original Anna come from? Anna Sorokin was born in Domodovo, a town outside of Moscow, Russia, but she primarily grew up in Germany. Anna and her younger brother grew up in a middle-class family. Her father was a truck driver or owned a heating and cooling business or both, and her mother had owned a convenience store at one time. Anna was very interested in fashion and attended school in Paris to pursue a degree in fashion. It is believed Paris is where she took on the last name Delvey. Anna landed a job working for Purple Magazine. She found her way to New York while working for Purple at Fashion Week in New York in 2013, and she never left. Okay, now back to the con. From what I observed from watching the Netflix film Inventing Anna, news articles and interviews, Anna was well-researched on her con. Not perfect, but well-versed on who was who in the socialite scene in New York and abroad, where the wealth was and who had it, where to go to be noticed in that circle, and she continuously evolved into the type of person who could potentially mingle in those circles, hopefully without detection of her middle-class upbringing. Oftentimes, liars and con artists will grossly exaggerate their wealth, status, and family history to compensate for their own insecurities about their lives, upbringing, or whatever specific issue they have that compels them to make somewhat of an alternate reality. Anna Sorokin managed to stay in the finest hotels, ate the finest foods at the best restaurants, rubbed shoulders and did business with powerful people, accountants and banks, and wore fashionable clothing as she continued to evolve her style into a wardrobe that was befitting of a wealthy German heiress. She often tipped extremely well wherever she went and demanded to foot the bill for friends while dining out or on travel excursions to exclusive resorts and millionaire hotspots around the world. However, one thing Anna could have used some help with was her blunt and brash way of talking and her sometimes very bratty demeanor and almost childlike behavior. However, sometimes it worked in her favor because it was touted as a consequence of her wealthy and entitled background. While Anna was in New York, freeloading and dodging payment at some of the best hotels, she checked into the 11 Howard Hotel in Soho on February 18, 2017 and she became friends with Nefertari Davis, Nef for short, a 25-year-old concierge at the hotel. She did find it odd that Anna checked in for a month, but Nef is an intricate part of Anna's story, including other friends she connected with, but Nef was particularly smitten with Anna. She somewhat forgave her bratty behavior and genuinely liked her. Anna was so strange, but yet intriguing to her approachable and somewhat unapproachable at the same time, and that seemed to work for her. As a concierge at a swanky hotel, Neff also knew where to tell her guests to go around the city. 
Although Anna had also done her own research to a certain extent, Neff was another eye for her to help her keep up with the Joneses. Anna showered Neff and the staff with crisp $100 bills for tips and attention frequently. According to the cut quote, over the next few weeks, Delvey stopped by often to ask Neff's advice, slipping her $100 bills each time. Neff would wax on about how Mr. Purple was totally washed and Vandal was for hipsters while Delvey's eyes would flit around behind her glasses. Eventually, Neff realized Delvey already knew all the cool places to go. Not only that, she knew the names of the bartenders and waiters and owners. This is not a guest that needs my help, it dawned on her. This is a guest that wants my time. Neff was an aspiring filmmaker, which Anna alluded to eventually funding for her, and Neff eventually also formed a loose business relationship with her as Anna's secretary or personal assistant. Here is a short audio clip of the real Neff talking about her relationship with Anna on the Dr. Phil show. Now, at the beginning of every episode of Netflix docuseries, Inventing Anna, there is a disclaimer that says, the whole story is completely true except for the parts that are totally made up. Well, Anna's friend Neff, the former concierge at 11 Howard Hotel, who you just saw in the previous clip, is very much a real person. And she's speaking out today for the very first time on television. And joining us from her home is Neff. You were a prominent uh, character in the Netflix series. I was curious how you thought you were depicted. Was it accurate, inaccurate? How'd you feel about it? It was amazing, Dr. Phil. It was very accurate. I was able to work close with Shonda and Shonda Land to make sure that the story, at least from my POV, was as accurate as possible. Well, I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. What would you like the world to know about Anna and about you? Wow. Well, about Anna, um, she's hilarious. So a lot of times she says things and people take it very serious, but She's really um, just super funny. Uh, she's she's an interesting person. I've never met anyone like her. So I really don't really have a, a deep description about her. Um, when it comes to our friendship, it was fun times. It just wasn't uh, truthful. So, you know, that kind of hurts. And what I want the world to know about me is, you know, I was just a young woman. I was in my early 20s. I was working at the concierge desk and this woman just never left. And we built a bond and it just so happened that, you know, she was a scammer. So I've separated myself from her in many ways and just started focusing on my film career and just using this opportunity to kind of help me, you know, get those film gigs that I always dreamed of in film school. Yes. And I, I hope something good does come out of it for you. Do you feel like you were used at the time? As you look back on it now, do you feel like she used you and exploited you? Definitely. This was a person that used me for my time. And I know people are like, oh, time isn't a big deal. But I lost a lot of time because of Anna. <laughs> she would sit at my desk. I would have to ignore other guests. She had a lot of requests, but, you know, it paid off. So I have no complaints, but she definitely used me. Yeah. And you said that she was fun at times, but unfortunately she was a scammer. Uh, what does that mean to you when you say she was a scammer? How do you define that? Just taking the route that you know you're not supposed to take. You know that you're not supposed to do things in a way where you're overdrafting an account, uh, you're taking from banks. So a scammer is someone that wants to do it the easy way to me um, and not work hard. I said before that I didn't think what she did was glamorous at all, that I thought she was a street hustler and a scammer and took advantage of people. Is that a fair assessment on my part? Well, yes, I mean, I totally agree with that, especially living in New York for 11 years. You meet hustlers, you meet people that you just described. So Anna wasn't much different than the people that I ran into in New York. So definitely, I guess the only glamorous part was the shopping, if you consider that glamorous. Yeah, well, she did have a flair for fashion. There's no doubt about that. Now, you haven't done a television interview uh, before. Why do you feel like now is the right time to speak out? 
she paid you back the money that she owed you. I'm the only person she ever paid back. Why do you think she paid you back and no one else? I always say she better have paid me back. <laughs> So now that you've heard from the real Neff, I'm going to dig deeper into what happened at the Hotel 11 Howard where Neff worked and the place where Neff met Anna. After Anna was staying at the hotel for about a month and a half, the hotel manager pulled Neff to the side because she was close with Anna and told her that Anna had not paid her bill, which was at that point $30,000. When Anna first came to the hotel, the hotel was new and having her credit card on file was overlooked. But she had told the hotel she would have a wire transfer sent to cover the cost, and she name-dropped Abby Rosen, who was the owner of the hotel, to make them believe she was a personal guest of his and a friend. She tried to smooch the staff over with a gift of Dom Perignon for everyone, but management wasn't falling for her charm and doubled down on receiving payment. Eventually, the $30,000 was wired to the hotel, but after that, Anna was still running up a bill because there was still no credit card on file. Not long before this issue with Anna's payment, Anna and Neff had went out to dinner and Neff ended up having to pay for the dinner because Anna's credit cards were declined. She was paid back triple for the dinner later, but her questionable wealth was looking even more shaky, although Neff still believed in her. Neff also had an awkward moment with Anna when she ran into Charlie Rosen, a son of Abby Rosen, the owner of Eleven Howard, and she mentioned Anna Delvey being at the hotel to him and he didn't know her. Anna had told Neff that she was buying a piece of property from Abby Rosen. So Charlie asked Neff what room she was in and then asked Neff why wouldn't Anna be rooming in a higher priced suite if she was buying a property from his father. Neff told Anna about the conversation and she quickly answered back something to the effect that she was so grateful to him that she remained silent about her room accommodations. Eventually, Anna was locked out of her room at 11 Howard while she happened to be away on a trip and her things were put in storage. Other friends of Anna, who were also featured in the Netflix film Inventing Anna, were Rachel Williams, a photo editor at Vanity Fair, and Casey Duke, a personal trainer slash life coach who had some celebrity clients. And although there are many stories from people who knew Anna and how they came to realize she was a swindler, the story of what happened to Rachel Williams while on a trip with Anna was highly publicized. Rachel Williams ended up writing a book about her experience and I believe she is still not happy or in communication with Anna to this day. Anna invited her friends on a trip to Morocco, which she was inspired to do because Khloe Kardashian had been there. During their stay at an exclusive resort in Morocco, the management confronted Anna about not receiving payment. The credit card she used to book the hotel was not functional and they needed a new form of payment. The management was threatening to call the police on Anna and goons also showed up. The situation became very hostile and Anna was not going to get out of this hotel in this situation with an empty promise of payment as she had done so flippantly in the past. Anna called Casey in New York for help, but her efforts to pay failed as well. So Casey called a friend of hers for help, but neither of their credit cards would work. Rachel Williams ended up using a credit card she used exclusively for Vanity Fair work-related expenses in the amount of $62,000, which she could not afford to do. So this is where the tension started between Anna and Rachel Williams, but what sealed their fate as friends was Anna did not immediately take care of the $62,000 credit card payment. This concludes part one of this two-part series about Anna Sorokin, a.k.a. Anna Delvey. In part two, I am going to pick up where this story left off and dig deeper into Anna's con. Where did she get her money? And how did she manage to secure such high-powered connections until it all came crashing down and she ended up in prison? See you in part two. Bloopers. This concludes part one of this part two series. Hello.